So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, using code.org's computer science fundamentals at home. And we're going to share with you some uh, of our workshop that we normally do. Um, my name is John Long, and I'm from the Department of Educational Technology. And today with me, we're going to have hopefully Julia Mates. She's having internet issues right now. We'll see if she gets uh, connected to our live stream. And we also have Sue Bailey, and I am really for, glad to work with Sue and Julia on this. We're both, we're all three of us are uh, code.org computer science facilitators. We're gonna focus on the fundamentals, but there are different components of uh, code.org for both the middle school and high school. And we have people around the district that do offer trainings for those as well. So if you're interested, please let us know and we can share those resources with you. So just to go over a couple of housekeeping tips before we get started. Uh, this session will be recorded and it will be posted on our website, which is edtechtraining.pondbeachschools.org. You can also subscribe to our channel by just clicking down below and subscribing or hit that little bell. And you can uh, be notified when our live streams are available. Uh, all of the resources we share today are going to be on our website, on the edtechtraining.pymeschools.org website. And we hope that you'll be asking questions or just throwing out ideas. So you can actually uh, chat over here, I believe it is, uh, in the chat window. And our um, moderators with little wrenches will be happy to answer your questions. One thing I do want to add is that if you have issues with code.org, uh, particular like lessons or puzzles or anything like that, you should uh, email support at code.org. That's a big resource that you should remember. So we're gonna get started and uh, let's just get, get launched into it. So this is using code.org computer science fundamentals. It's gonna be a brief overview. We're gonna show you some of the activities and stuff like that to show you a little bit about how this works. And we're gonna show you some of the lessons too. And I'm gonna show you some really cool things to share with you. So there's a lot to share with you today. So let's go over the objectives for today. We're gonna to go over the code.org fundamentals. We're gonna showcase digital citizenship ideas because right now we're in a time of remote learning and our students probably need some extra help on focusing on digital citizenship, like places they should go, who they should talk to online, or if they, should, they shouldn't be talking to anyone online without parent permission, of course, or some other things that they need to think about, or keeping their passwords uh, protected, those kinds of activities. Then we're gonna go through unplugged activities and what that is. We're gonna talk about what plugged activities are. And then Sue's gonna talk about dashboard setup because she actually gets to use this in her own school. Uh, down below are some of the hashtags and accounts that you can tweet from. And at the end, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Code Break and just share with you some of those resources. So let's talk about it a little bit. Computer Science, uh, Code.org stands for uh, Computer Science Fundamentals. Uh, you can sign in with your Google account, your district account. Uh, down below, you'll see a breakdown of all the courses for code.org. You have computer science fundamentals, which is basically uh, K through five. Uh, CS discoveries, computer science discoveries, which is middle school and up into the upper elementary schools and computer science principles. And those trainings are a little bit more detailed. Uh, Pre-Reader Express and the CS Fundamentals Express cover a little bit of the 12. So that's why we're doing the fundamentals piece. So you can actually see some of those and you can get uh, professional development. We can offer that later as well. Um, I don't know if Julia's online with us, um, but I'm going to just like go ahead and uh, do Julia's part. Julia, if you're here, feel free to in interrupt me. She's and not here yet, John. Uh, she's still restarting her computer with some internet issues, so. Okay, thanks, John. I appreciate yeah. the letting us know. So let's just talk about some digital citizenship stuff. So um, I wanted to go over three lessons that are in code.org. Uh, we have course A, which is going places safely. Uh, and then lesson one, course C is screen out the mean cyberbullying. And I put out the handout there, right there. So if you wanted to share that with your students, how they can prevent from being cyberbullied, 
Um, I, it may be someone in the class, it may be someone from other classes, but this is a really important piece to actually bring out during these times. And it's really good to kind of have these conversations with your students. Uh, even if your students are at home and you wanna print these out, all of this information is free. It doesn't cost anything. All you have to do is go and add it. And then of course, uh, eight lesson, um, E is a private and personal information. And that's really important. The students need to learn how to share things um, about private and personal information and what that gets taught. And there are videos on the website to share and stuff like that. Um, there's handouts. And we'll include some of these handouts on the website so you don't have to go and hunt for them. But let me go ahead, since Julia's not here, and I'm gonna go into uh, a little bit about the courses. So I'm gonna just go ahead and switch to the unplugged versus the plugged activity here. So this is kind of like what we're gonna talk about uh, today a little bit. So you've got all those courses. You have course A for kindergarten, course B for first grade, course uh, C for second and so on and so forth. Course A and B are designed for students that don't need any pre-reading activities. So there's no words, it's basically graphics that are available. And so those are gonna be courses that are gonna be designed. It may be for your ELL, it may be for your students that have trouble reading, but it's great for those that don't have any technology expertise. And some of our students really don't have much expertise when it comes to technology. They're still kind of learning those pieces. So what is an unplugged activity? Well, an unplugged activity means no technology required. So we're gonna share with you an unplugged activity, but I actually, plugged it in a little bit, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like. And it's called Happy Maps, and it's learn how to create an algorithm to do a piece of puzzle. And I'm gonna share that unplugged activity with you at first, but then I'm gonna show you with the plugged activity, which is the online pu puzzles, called Sequencing with Scrat. And that's gonna be how you take the activities you learned on the unplugged and use it with the plug and say they work together. And then I've got a fun activity called Getting Loopy With You. And this is great for getting kids off the computer and doing some things that you can kind of get them to move. And I'm gonna talk about loops with Harvester. So I'm gonna switch over to this part. Um, this is what I wanna show you. This is course A. In course A, uh, remember that's a pre-reader course. Uh, you're viewing it as like a, uh, a, a student would do. I didn't sign in, but I just wanted to show you where the unplugged activities is. So like this is going to be a video for the students and stuff like that. So like I could actually play the video if I wanted to and just see what the video, I can download this. I can put a link to this video into my Google Classroom. So if you wanna make this into an assignment where they watch the video, and then have a discussion, that's a great way of doing like a flipped model in your classrooms and stuff like that. So you can always come back to this, it's always gonna be there. So that's gonna be how you do um, like some of the digital citizenship lessons. And so there's all kinds of digital citizenship lessons that you can find in each of the courses. Let me show you how to get to this course. So if you ever wanted to go back to the course, you can always go to teach right here. Scroll down, keep on scrolling. Oh. Let's go under here under elementary. That's where I meant to go. And here's some of the things where they could talk about the water cycle and some of the projects. Here's that gra graphic I took from. But like here are all the other courses. If you wanna view the courses or you can view the lesson plans. So if I wanted to view those lesson plans, I could do that. So let me go in to view lesson plans um, for this one. And this is the digital citizenship called Screen Out the Mean, which was focusing on cyberbullying. Also notice down here was the lesson two, which is powerful passwords, and it helps them design a powerful password. And you know, like anyone, that it takes a lot of work to create a password. So let's just go through this lesson real quickly. And you'll notice that it has Screen Out the Mean. This is the purpose, this is the agenda. 
Uh, these are the objectives. This is the preparation. A lot of them have documents now that are Google documents, so you can make a copy of the document. It has links to the Common Sense Media. And one thing I want to point out about this is that um, Re uh, Rebecca Smickla on the Educational Technology team has created an uh, awesome resource from Combat Sense Media for TechSafe. So if you're familiar with TechSafe every year, a lot of this stuff is what we use in TechSafe, which is techsafe.pommyschools.org. And correct me if I'm wrong, Rebecca, because I know she's back there somewhere. Uh, but you can actually use this website. Here is the handouts for the students. There's the online safety poster. So you can make a copy of this and you can link that into your Google Classroom and create different types of lessons with some of these activities. And this is a good time of the year to kind of do that as summer is getting close and they'll have that all that time. And we want them to practice safe skills uh, at home uh, during the summer with their digital device and their digital footprint. So I've kind of did a little bit on the digital citizenship. Let's talk about Happy Maps a little bit here, okay? Happy Maps is a lesson that's designed to teach them sequencing. Um, it's designed to focus on algorithm debugging. If you didn't know what an uh, algorithm, it's basically the definition's right there, a list of steps to finish a task. So like if you're doing how-tos, like how to build a peanut butter sandwich or how to plant a seed, those are algorithms. Uh, debugging is a way of finding and fixing problems on an algorithm. And a program is an algorithm that's been coded into something special. And we're gonna actually use uh, happy Maps to talk about how to make a program using an algorithm. And down here is the teaching guide if you want to use those pieces and stuff like that. One thing I want to point out is it is aligned to different types of standards like Common Core Language Arts and also uh, the Common Core Math Standards and also the Next Generation Science Standards. Some of them are designed to the engineering standards and the computer science standards as well because there are sets of, oh, here's the computer science standards right here. So you can actually show how they're doing, aligning those to different standards. So let me just go through this activity with you right now. So Happy Maps uses uh, I, um, Happy Maps cards. Now here are some example cards right here. And you see the arrows? You're making Flurb get to the fruit. And you use the arrows over here to go to the fruit. So they would draw the arrows over here. So you can actually download this worksheet and kind of hear some different samples of Flurb getting to the fruit. There are multiple ways for Flurb. He could go this way, he could go down this way. It's all different types of answers. And you see how Flurb gets really complex here. Well, I actually digitized this a little bit using Jamboard. So if I go over here to this tab here, here is my Jamboard grid. And what I'm going to do is I basically grab the graphics from a image and import them into my Jamboard. And now I have movable pieces for my Jamboard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put Flurb over here. And I can reduce him a little bit. I can even rotate him a little bit if I want to, but I'm not going to do it too much. There's Flurb. And I want to put my pineapple in here. And let's say I put my pineapple right here. So I'm going to need to um, move my arrows to create my program for flur Flurb to get to the pineapple. So I come over here and I grab this arrow. Oh, there's no more arrows. Uh, but guess what? I can duplicate this arrow. There it is. And this time I want to turn it so it goes down. And then I want to duplicate it again. And this is how Flurb would get to the fruit. Takes him four steps, one, two, three, four. And this would be a rotation and stuff like that. There are other ways for Flurb, but the idea is that they can take this component and move them out and start over again. So you could actually share this with your students and you can share a copy of the student with your students and they can, you can put it in your Google Drive. Got it, click done.
And then they can just keep reusing it over and over and over. And it, I would give them a copy of the Jamboard instead of the actual Jamboard. So if they needed to make a mistake and they wanted a fresh copy, they can make their own copies. And they could do this with, together in teams. They could do this in all kinds of different ways uh, with uh, the uh, Jamboard, which is a great example of taking things. And you can do this with several of things. It was real easy just to take the graphics and move over and just replicate it. And I'm gonna share the Jamboard with you on our website. Uh, so this is the plugged activity. So the plugged activity is the online puzzles. So it's gonna be exactly like the unplugged, which has happy maps, which I'm using Flurb to get to the fruit. But in this case, I'm using Scrat from Ice Age to get to the acorn. So here is directions to get Scrat to the acorn, snap the east or the right block to the bottom of the win run, block then the run. Okay, I can't even say it right. But click OK. And so all you're gonna do is just take this piece and attach it, and it's gonna click in place. And when you're done, you're just gonna click run. Yay! And we just wrote our first line of code. Let's click on continue. And then it keeps on advancing. So like, it's gonna do the same thing. So like, I can come over here and do two of these. Click run. And click on continue. So I'm now up to the, my fourth puzzle. Now, one thing you can do is there is a step button. It will actually help you figure out where your steps are. You can also reset this puzzle if you need to, and you can drag the pieces over here into the and back into the trash. There's an audio button here for hearing feedback, and this does come in multiple languages. So it comes in all these different languages if you use the current year's curriculum. There's different curriculums for different years. So those can change from time to time. So that's basically how you get started with um, your code. So I am going to move on to my next one, which is getting loopy. OK? So getting loopy is a great tool here. It has a great worksheet. I'm going to actually unplug here because um, if I were to do this, this is the, the uh, worksheet. The concept they're learning with getting loopy is actually doing a loop or repeat. Uh, in coding, sometimes you need to loop it because it takes too many steps to write out the code over and over and over. So getting loopy is one way of actually doing that. And so there is an unplugged video here. There's also a worksheet and there is an assessment, but I already have that downloaded here. So like here is the uh, sequence for getting loopy here. So it's basically going to be um, clap three times, Behind your head, waist. Behind your head, waist. Clap three times. Left, up, right, up. Left, up, right, up. Clap three times. And you have to repeat that before you do the belly laugh. Now, the idea is you should mix it up. Now, I like to do this one several times and let the kids mix it up because the, they're learning the concept of loopy. So I'm hoping you can see that if they did this in your online class, it's a kind of a way of getting them up moving, and it helps prep them for doing loops in coding. So the corresponding puzzle for this is called Harvester, where you pick up the different loops, OK? So like, here is kind of like the code for Harvester and stuff like that. So you can go north, south, east, west. But then you have this loop access here where it tells you to loop the process. And the idea is that you're going to do this with uh, seven blocks. And uh, I'm going to just have it go this. And then I'm going to have it pick it up and then go east and then pick it up and then go east one more time and pick it up. 
Let's see if I'm right. Probably not, but here we'll just try. All right. So that was doing it without the loops. Now it says, what if I wanted to do it with the loops? Okay. So what I could do is this is I can actually drag this over. And talk about this uh, pickup right here. Let's see, uh, going over, we're going to go west here. And um, we're going to let Julia come back on and do her part in just a second. So I just wanted to kind of finish this. But I just wanted a little looping piece like this. One of my favorites of the looping is doing this, which is from an old curriculum, but I remembered it, is where you can actually do this with this with uh, Ray and BB-8. So basically it's going to be move forward and then uh, I think it's not one, two, three, four, five. Let's try it and see. Yay! I completed the plot puzzle too. So all right. So that's actually getting loopy and stuff like that. So I'm actually going to let um, Julia kick in and she may have some more insights in the digital citizenship and then if there's one more on I'll come back. All right. Is Julia there? I'm here. Um, thank you so much for covering because um, I had a little difficulty with the internet. Um, I just really wanted to share um, that digital citizenship, the citizenship is really about the responsibility of us in technology and into in our society right now it's extremely important. Code.org, um, in collaboration with Common Sense Media, developed lessons for our students to learn more about that citizenship and its importance. The lessons um, really focus around empathy, how the internet works, understanding user data, practice um, periods, and um, a collaboration so that students can feel comfortable and parents can feel comfortable utilizing the internet effectively. I don't know what John covered already, so I don't want to take up too much of anyone else's presentation. So I basically just went through the lessons A, B, and C, where to find them and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but I also shared out the screen out, so I just wanted to share those pieces with you. I don't know if you had any other insights that you want to add to those pieces. Well, I think that keeping information private, like names, ages, addresses, email addresses, when um, you go to school after school, wearing shirts with your names on them um, in those components of being online are identifying factors and it's really important to not share them. But I think that these lessons really help um, showcase that for teachers and bring that to perspective. Definitely. And uh, one thing you might want to do, Julia, you're good at this. T show them how um, how cybersecurity is becoming a big deal in our community. Um, well, pretty much people are trying to hack everyone all the time. And cybersecurity has become one of the biggest fields um, in our community. Um, coding, um, being able to protect um, organizations has become um, one of the biggest asks for our businesses locally as well as nationally and inter internationally. <clears throat> and Julia works a lot with our, um, our uh, community partners out there and stuff like that. And that's one of their biggest asks. That's why I like for her to share that because she's uh, been in touch with our community leaders about what they're looking. So digital citizenship is a big key to that. So yeah. cybersecurity is really important. So like, that's really important. Thanks, Julia. Thank I you. appreciate that. So um, one of the questions I noticed in the chat was how to create an account. If you go to code.org, uh, you can actually create an account. It's free. There's no cost to code.org whatsoever. Uh, and you can sign in with your Google account. So uh, you can actually do that. And that's a good segue to actually go through and start moving it to Sue Bailey, who we are very glad to have because Sue's at Poinciana Elementary School. And she's going to share with you a little bit about the dashboard. So Sue, you might want to hit, take a little 
bit about the account, but take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I'm going to talk about that, and then I'm going to show you what's called, John already mentioned, the dashboard, which is how you would manage your students after you've created an account. If you go to sign in, one of the options over here is continue with Google. And the person that asked about creating an account, you can go right here to create your account and make sure that you use your school email address. Because when you do that, if you do continue with Google, it's going to see your account because over here I'm signed into Google Chrome as me. And then right now what it's doing is it's, it's telling me that it's going to pull all my data from Google Classroom. And I'm going to explain that in just a minute, but I'm going to allow that. And here I am at my dashboard. It tells me that I'm signed in. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit, and I have a whole bunch of classes in here. But what I wanted to show you is how to create a section, how you're going to put your students in. And the easiest thing to do is right down here through Google Classroom. If you're a media specialist, a fine arts teacher, if you deal with multiple classes, this may not be the best way to do it. And I'm going to come back and show you another way in just a minute. But if you choose Google Classroom, it goes in and it finds the name of your Google Classrooms. And I'm going to use Mrs. Castrillo's class. And I'm going to choose this section. And now um, it asks me, this is third grade. And then it wants me to choose a course. And we go into this a little bit more in depth in our full, um, in our full day workshop. But you have John talked about the fundamentals courses right here, the Express, the Pre-Reader Express. And these are basically the puzzles without the unplugged. Um, there's also a ton of hour of code activities. You can choose these. They're a little bit shorter. So you want to spend a little time familiarizing yourself with these before you decide what you're going to do. I'm just, this is third grade, so I'm going to choose course D. Over here it says um, 2019 recommended. Every year they change their curriculum just slightly. And this summer they're getting ready to switch over to the 2020. So for now I'm going to use the 2019. Lesson extras, um, if you leave this on at the end of a level, it gives the kids options to do um, kind of extra puzzles. They're more challenging. And if you leave that on, they get it. But it gives them the option. They don't have to do it. They can skip it. And I'm going to say not enable pair programming for now because the kids are not with each other. They're doing this from home. So they wouldn't be pair programming. So I'm going to save this. And now it's added to my dashboard, Mrs. Castrillo's class. And if I click here, it has all automatically pulled in all of the students that were in that Google Classroom. And there they all are. Um, one word of caution, I'm a co-teacher with Mrs. Castrillo. She's actually a third grade teacher at my school. Um, Mrs. Castrillo and I co-teach in Google Classroom but you cannot Google, you cannot co-teach in code.org. And what would happen if Mrs. Castrillo now goes and tries to create a code.org account with her Google Classroom, it will actually remove it from my dashboard and it'll switch it over to her dashboard. So that's, that's one of the downsides to this if you are a co-teacher. Now, if you're a classroom teacher, that's a super easy way to do it. If you are not a classroom teacher, and you have multiple students and multiple classes, I would recommend using personal logins. And personal logins, they're going to use their school email address. So I'm just going to call this Ms. Bailey's class, and I'll call this fifth grade, and I'll do course F. And turn off. OK. All right. So now what it's done is it's created a code 
over here, which I need to write down real quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share this code. You'll notice now it says add students. Um, so I'm going to share this code with the students. And the students are going to type the code in. And they're going to use their Google email also to sign in. So I'm going to pop over here to Safari. And I'm going to go to sign in. I'm going to continue with Google. Only this time, and this would make it a little tricky for younger kids. Um, I actually, the student would have to put their email in. And Rebecca, this would be a good point for you to hide my screen while I type in. I'm going to use a real kid's um, email address. So give me just a second. Hmm, now it looks like I might be having internet issues. Let me give this another second. All right, Rebecca, you could bring me back. Um, so the students would sign in with their email address and then they would you would give them that code and they would put the code in and that's how that they would join your section. And you could do different sections for different classes if, again, if you're a media specialist or fine arts teacher or someone else that deals with multiple classes. So I am beginning to have internet issues here. So I think that's gonna be it for me. Okay, thanks, Sue. I appreciate that. Uh, there are lots of different videos on how to get set up with your um, um, dashboard, and so we'll include those into our live stream as well. A couple things I wanted to share with you is on Code Break. Uh, Code.org has created this nice little break to give students kind of a break from their lessons and stuff like that. And it happens every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, stuff like that. And each week they have different guest speakers and stuff like that. They had um, Bill Gates a few weeks ago, and they interact with H Hadi Partavi, which is the founder for Code.org. They have a new activity, and it's just a way to have like a little 10-minute break from your coding and stuff like that. And so I wanted to share that with you because that's a resource that you can post in your Google Classrooms and say, okay, kids, here's a little bit of a break. Just go over there. They make it do some dance party stuff because you can code for the dance party, which was a big kick in last year's hour of code and the previous year's hour of code. And so those are some things you might want to check out and stuff like that. A couple of things I want to do and like uh, wrap up a little bit and then we'll take some questions um do we have any questions going on i think that's it as far as questions um a couple of things i wanted to share with you this is something really big and we hope that you'll be able to attend this is our digital our remote digital learning institute on june 9th and 10th it's two separate days, but you can attend both days because they're two different agendas. You can earn up to 10 in-service points per day. If you don't need the in-service points, you can just pick and choose. The schedule will be out shortly. Uh, we're fine tuning our, our speaker list. We've got some speakers from all across the country that are gonna be talking about remote learning and digital learning and what that looks like in our classrooms today. Uh, you can register by scanning that QR code right there, 
or you can click, uh, you can use the link right there, which is uh, bit.ly slash remote institute. And it is case sensitive. So you'll need to add the capital R for remote and capital I for institute. Uh, so you can register for that. And it's coming up in a few weeks. We're very excited about that. Registration is open and you can register at any time. Um, Starting next week, we are very excited about our virtual learning experiences, and we've got a host of different experiences. We'll start posting them to our website this next, well, actually, they're already on our calendar for next week. We have different events all next week, and you'll not want to miss those. We've got people that are going to be from the Science Center. We've got things from um, former vice presidents of Disney World which is how their career started. We've got some different careers going and some virtual field trips. Uh, this Wednesday, we've got a great lineup. We have another lessons learned teacher panel at 8 a.m. We've got our smart team with us at 1230. And we're gonna hear from our PE folks about uh, disconnecting and getting movement and stuff like that. Because in this digital environment, it is important to get up and move. We all need to do that. Uh, us more than the kids sometimes. I think it's us uh, getting up and move. Friday, we're going to have a principals panel hosted by our director, Dr. Adam Miller. And he's gonna be talking with principals about what they've learned, their lessons during this time, and sharing their expert their expertise and all this, and how they've worked with their staffs, and then we're going to have another roundup on the year end roundup with our smart team at eleven thirty on Friday. So you're not going to want to miss those live streams. Uh, so it will actually work well with you. Uh, if you need assistance. Uh, please feel free to fill out this form. Our smart team and our ed tech training team are monitoring the site, and they can get you help with all things Google, as well as our smart uh, um, SLSO. And the form is case sensitive. It's bit.ly slash help form ed tech. And so that is uh, kind of a roundup. If you got have any questions about today uh, and about using any of this, feel free to reach out to us. Um, this is uh, our contact information and our Twitter uh, handles. And um, Sue and Julia, I'm gonna give you a chance to uh, say some closing words before we wrap up for today. And um, thank you. Um, John, it finally loaded the page that I was trying to get. So I just wanna show everybody quickly that what it what you did not see is when a student signs in with um, their Google account, it actually goes to the portal page, which may be why I was having trouble, but it finally loaded through the portal page. So I put the student's ID in on the portal page, and then it goes to code.org. And what they would do down here is where they would put that section code. and join the section, and now you can see that this student is part of the class that I just created. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. It's pretty quick, but um, that's how that, that works. And um, there is my Twitter. My email is sue.bailey at palmbeachschools.org. If anybody needs further assistance, I'm always happy to help. So send me an email, and that's it for me. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. Um, I just really wanted to share that, as John was um, saying before, our community and nation need people that can code. FPL no longer has people climb up um, a telephone line to see where issues are. Drones are doing a lot of those services, RoboDogs, and um, many other um, companies are utilizing those same technologies. So it's really vital for our students to learn how to code and have this exposure this language is something that is going to help us grow forward, um, especially in a time where we're all very dependent on technology. Yeah, and those people are not losing their jobs right now. 
Yep, they're actually looking for people to do those jobs and stuff they like that. They are indeed. So, uh, thank you both ladies for joining us. I appreciate uh, coding is a big essential skill if they're, for our students and we want them to be successful in the future. And so we hope that you'll give them some opportunity to do some coding because they enjoy it and they actually look forward to it. And we thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Bye.